The so-called clipping region is the bounds on the coordinate grid within which drawing operations actually produce an effect. When you draw outside the clipping region, uh, any pixels you attempt to draw, just nothing happens. When you create a new canvas, of course, the clipping region is synonymous with the bounds of the canvas itself. You can set a different clipping region, however, using the clip method. The clip method sets the clip region to the intersection of the current path and the current clipping region. And if at any time you wish to reset the bounds of the clipping region to be the same as the bounds of the canvas, you can do so with the reset clip method. So here's a simple example. We first create a triangular shaped path, and then when we invoke clip, that becomes the clipping region because it intersects with the current clipping region, which is currently the entirety of the canvas. So understand that the clip method effectively always sets the clipping region to a subsection of the current clipping region. Now that our triangular clipping region is set, if we then attempt to draw an image onto the entirety of the canvas, as we do here with draw image uh, at coordinate 0, 0 and uh, dimensions of 500 by 500, well, the only pixels that get drawn to are within the clipping region, the triangular area. All other pixels that would normally be drawn by this operation don't get drawn because they are outside the clipping area. With the translate, rotate, and scale methods, we can actually transform the coordinate grid. Uh, we can move it up, down, left, right, uh, rotate it, or scale it up and down. The methods themselves are quite straightforward. Just keep in mind that rotate expects an angle expressed in radians, translate expects arguments which are coordinate grids, and scale expects arguments which are scale factors, e.g. an x argument of 2 to the scale method scales the grid along its x-axis by a factor of 2. The arguments 1 and 1 to the scale method would leave the scaling unchanged. So consider a simple example. Here we're drawing a red square at coordinate 0, 0, but beforehand we have invoked translate with the argument 100, 100. So we have moved the origin, the 0, 0 coordinate of our grid, from where it normally sits at the top left of the canvas to the position that was 100, 100. That now is actually the origin of our coordinate grid, so when we draw at 0, 0, that's where the square here appears. If, after the translation, we then throw in a rotation of 0 0.5 radians, well, that's about uh, 30 degrees, so you can see here now that the square appears rotated because the grid itself has been rotated. The square is still drawn with all four of its corners at the precise same coordinates, it's just that now those coordinates are in different positions on the canvas. If, after the rotation, we also scale the canvas with the arguments 2 and 1, meaning scale the x-axis by a factor of 2 and the y-axis by a factor of 1, effectively leaving the y-axis unchanged, uh, this is the result. Again, the square is actually being drawn with its corners at precisely the same coordinates, it's just that now those coordinates appear on the canvas, such that now the square is drawn twice as wide. Now, one very important thing to understand is that the order of your transformations can matter. Here, for example, we've done the same scaling, translation, and rotation, just in a different order, and we get a very different result. Because we scaled first, when we then translated, the coordinate 100, 100 in our scaled grid appears at the position of what is normally 200, 100. Oddest of all, because our x-axis has been scaled non-proportional to the y-axis, when we rotate, we actually end up with skewing. Effectively, the x and y axes of our grid are no longer perpendicular to each other. Admittedly, this is very odd behavior, but the explanation for it has to do with the math behind how these transformations are performed. What our transformations are really doing is not moving an invisible grid, but actually changing these numbers in what's called the transformation matrix. The transformation matrix is a matrix of numbers used in our drawing operations that effectively determine where the pixels we draw actually appear on the canvas. It just works out that the math behind this transformation matrix means that when you rotate a non-proportionally scaled grid, what you end up with is a grid that is no longer perpendicular. We won't go into the math behind this here, but if you're looking for an explanation, that's where you'll find it. Now, this transformation matrix, the state of the coordinate grid, it is one part of the state of the context object. This state of the context also includes the current clipping region and the values of most of the attributes of the context object, the stroke style, the fill style, global alpha, line width, um, etc., etc. With the save method of the context object, we can push the state of the context 
onto a stack in the context, which we can then later restore with the restore method. So if you've configured the state how you like it, if you've set a clipping region and a certain transformation matrix and certain values in the various properties and you want to come back to that later, um, you should save it with the save method and then later you can restore it with the restore method. Just understand that these contexts are being stored on a last in first out stack. Save always pushes the current context onto the top of the stack and restore always restores the state from whatever was last pushed onto the stack. Also be clear that this context state does not include the actual pixels on the canvas. Those aren't part of the context, and nor actually is the current path part of the context. A common practice with these methods is if in your drawing functions you're going to modify the context, at the start of the function you should first save the context, and then at the end of the function restore it. That way your other drawing code won't be affected by any changes you make to the context in your function. If you wish to directly read or write the individual pixel values that make up your canvas, you can do so with these methods. The getImageData method returns an image data object representing one portion of the canvas, the portion at the specified coordinate with the specified width and height. The image data object has three properties, width, height, and data. Width and height obviously represent the pixel dimensions of the data. And because the width and height we specify for the get image data call are in terms of the coordinate grid, not necessarily in terms of pixels, the width and height values in the image data object may differ. The data property of the image data object is an array containing the actual pixel data. Somewhat surprisingly, each element of the array is not one individual pixel, but actually just one individual channel of each pixel. Because we have four channels per pixel, red, green, blue, and alpha, so each pixel is actually represented by a group of four elements of the array. Index 0 in the data array is the red channel value for the first pixel. Index 1 is the green channel for that same pixel. Index 2 is the blue channel. Index 3 is the alpha channel. And then indices 4 through 7 represent the second pixel. Indices 8 through 11 represent the third pixel, and so forth. Also understand that all of the pixels of the image data are in this one array. There aren't separate arrays for the separate rows of pixels. There's just one long array. So if you want to find, say, the seventh pixel in the fourth row, you add seven to three times the width. And then you multiply that times four to get the index of the red channel of the seventh pixel in the fourth row. Now, when you get an image data object with the get image data method, you can read and write the values in the data array but any changes you make won't actually show up on the canvas from which we got the image data. To actually write the pixel data of an image data object onto a canvas, we use the put image data object. And note that we specify a coordinate at which to draw that data, but not a dimension. It's always drawn with the same dimensions as the image data itself. And in this case, the dimensions are just in terms of pixels. So if the image data is 500 pixels wide, then it will draw as 500 actual pixels. Uh, no matter the current settings of the coordinate grid. So, for a very simple example of what you might do with these methods, here we are modifying the alpha value of every pixel on a canvas such that it is fully opaque, that it has a value of 1. First, we're getting the image data of the full canvas by invoking on the context object the getImageData method with the arguments 0, 0, meaning starting in the top left corner, and with the width and height which is the same as the current width and height of the canvas itself. Once we have our image data object, we loop through the data property array starting at index 3, because that is the alpha channel of the first pixel, and we iterate our counter by 4, because every fourth element is the next alpha channel. So our loop index will go 3, 7, 11, 15, 19, etc. In the body of the loop, we set the array value at that index to the value 1. A fully opaque alpha value. So we've modified the image data, it's just that this hasn't actually affected the canvas yet. To actually affect the pixels of the canvas, we need to copy them back out to the canvas. And we do so with the put image data method, to which we supply the image data object as the first argument, and specify the coordinate 0, 0. So we've copied out all of the pixels of the canvas, we've gone through all the pixels and set their alpha channel to 1, 
and then we write that pixel data back to the canvas at the same position, 0, 0. Whatever the alpha values of any of the pixels were, they are now all set to 1.